Buonasera. <coughs> Buonasera a tutti. Mm. Stasera siamo veramente molto privilegiati di avere fra di noi uh, il uh, professor uh, <coughs> Thomas Remer del Collège de France e sarà introdotto con tutti i dettagli uh, da professor Beret. E veramente benvenuto fra di noi, siamo molto lieti e io vorrei anche ringraziare tantissimo il gruppo che ha organizzato questa serata e tutta questa giornata, <coughs> uh, Juan Manuel Granados, uh, uh, Paul Beret e Benedetta Rossi e specialmente anche il uh, centro di San Luigi uh, francese qui a Roma. Quindi, Thomas, uh, benvenuti, bienvenuto, herzlich willkommen. <laughs> Passo la parola a Polvere. Thank you, Father Rector. Um, I would like to um, ask Mr. François Xavier Adam. He is the director of the Uh, French Center Institut uh, Saint Louis, and they sponsored the the presence and uh, of Professor Römer here at the uh, Biblical Institute. So this time, and then as uh, we have planned in April, so uh, we are very grateful to uh, uh, Mr. Adam for this gracious gift to our institute. So I'd like to uh, give him the floor. Um, buonasera. Si parla francese va bene? Oh. <laughs> no, perché parliamo italiano o dopo inglese? Emilio, juste un petit mot pour dire qu'on est très honoré euh, de la venue du professeur euh, Romer à Rome, que vous connaissez bien au Biblicum, que vous connaissez bien mieux que moi. Et euh, c'est vraiment important. Le, en tout cas, depuis que je suis là, c'est le premier séjour d'un membre du Collège de France, mais pas la première fois pour le professeur Romer. Et il y aura un autre séjour, comme vous le savez, en avril. Euh, je pense que c'est essentiel pour le Centre Saint-Louis, créé en 1945, de travailler avec euh, l'Institut Pontifical Biblique, puisque euh, vous êtes euh, l'avenir et la force vive d'une interprétation de texte, en tout cas d'un travail sur le texte. Et de nos jours, euh, dans le monde actuel, euh, les textes, comme on le voit, ce qui se passe en Méditerranée, euh, sont utilisés, manipulés, de manière inconsidérée. Et c'est important de pouvoir... Euh, de pouvoir faire ce travail de fond, euh, évidemment avec le titre de la conférence et le professeur Romer a beaucoup d'humour, on pense tous aux aventuriers de l'Arche perdue, mais je ne crois pas que vous ayez un fouet avec vous, professeur, et je voudrais juste euh, donc un petit point supplémentaire, euh, le, nous proposons de temps en temps, chaque année du moins, deux choses alors, euh, au centre Saint-Louis que vous connaissez peut-être, je n'ai pas vous couvu d'élèves du Biblicum, nous avons des bourses pour aller étudier en France, des bourses de recherche et des bourses pour le français. Donc si jamais des étudiants, vous comprenez ce que je dis Abbiamo un programme di borsi per uh, ricerche uh, in Francia ou anche per uh, uh, appri uh, apprendre. Uh, si, uh, Par la lingua francese, ok. Si, si, sì, imparare la lingua francese. Uh, si, come vous connaissez. E abbiamo anche un, un, un prezzo che si chiama il prezzo Henri de Lubac. Non so se lo conoscono. Un prezzo per una, le tese che sono fatti nelle università pontificie. Ma due anni sono qui a Roma, ma non ho visto una tesa dal... Biblicum. Bon, C'est une, une proposition. Donc merci encore au Biblique pour sa coopération. 
Euh, merci à son recteur et merci au père euh, Paul Béré pour son accompagnement. Et puis je vous laisse avec euh, le professeur Thomas Romer. Merci. Euh, merci François Xavier. Um, so now we give the floor to Professor Romer, who was born on a December 13th. Today it is December 14th. So for those who were with us this morning, you understand what I mean. For those who weren't, you can guess. So happy birthday again. <laughs> Until it's midnight, it's your birthday. <laughs> so um, I would like to give the floor to Professor Roma. He's, he's, uh, he has already been introduced by our rector He will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we will have half an hour to interact with him, ask questions, and the questions may be asked either in English or in Italian. Or in French, he says. <laughs> or in German, he adds. <laughs> Sehr gut. So, um, I don't want to take uh, more time than that. Let me, I, I won't introduce him, he has already been introduced and we know him. So, uh, Professor Roma, welcome. And you want to talk about the mysteries of the Ark. We are really uh, overexcited to see, because when it's mysterious, everybody wants to know. <laughs> so, we're listening to you and most welcome again. Okay, thank you. Uh, both? Uh, we'll try. Okay, can you hear me or? Yes. Closer? Closer. Okay. It's better? Yeah, okay. Wonderful. So, uh, thank you first of all to Paul Berry, to Monsieur Adam for this kind invitation. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, for me, it's a special place because I have so many colleagues I appreciate very much. And I just want to mention Jean Louis Carr and my colleague June Tuolini, which I, with whom I had some whiskeys, but it's a long time, <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> so it's always a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, yeah, when I asked the question which language I shall speak, uh, Paul told me English. So English has become the new lingua franca which I had to accept. There was a time that was Latin. I would not dare to give a lecture in Latin anymore here. I don't know if it's still going on. Probably not. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I uh, am very happy to be here. Uh, so Paul told me 45 minutes. I had a li little longer one, but I will try to, to, uh, yeah, to be as short as possible. It's difficult to be as short as possible if you speak about the Ark, because uh, the Ark of the Covenant, so <laughs> you just mentioned uh, the riders of the lost Ark. Uh, there are so many things going on with uh, the Ark. Uh, it has become uh, so often uh, object of movies and uh, painters and even physicists, they were asking what was inside the Ark. So uh, I think we can speak of mysteries. I don't know if I can resolve some mysteries, but I will give you some, uh, some ideas, I hope. And I'm also looking forward to uh, our discussion we can have. Maybe let's start with uh, what is an arc. Uh, in English and also in other languages, there's some confusion about the arc because uh, the reader of the Bible finds at least two arcs the Ark of Noah and the Ark of the Covenant. And this is due, of course, to the Latin translation, probably inspired by the Greek translation. Uh, the Latin then uses the term arca, meaning chest, box, a coffer, coffin, for two different Hebrew words. So it's important to, to look at the Hebrew term. So the term teba uh, is used for Noah's Ark, And also, in a way, for Moses has also kind of an ark, the box in which he is uh, put by his mother. We spoke with the students. Some of the students, you must be very tired because it has been a very long day, so I hope <laughs> you can still stand this conversation. So, uh, <clears throat> 
This word comes probably from Egyptian. We had a discussion about parallels and so. So uh, either from a word which means uh, dabat, sanctuary, or another tabat, coffer or box. With Egyptian, we have the same problem with other languages because there's no vocalization. The, the Egyptologists decided to be a, a but yeah, we don't know. Anyhow, so, uh, <coughs> and then the second word, it's aron. Aron, which means a box or a coffer, which is used very often, more than 200 times in the Bible, and almost exclusively for the Ark of the Covenant. But there are other words, I will come back to this. There are two exceptions in uh, Genesis 50. It's uh, the coffin where Joseph is put, and then in 2 Kings 12, uh, with a parallel in, Num in Chronicles, it's a money chest, so it's a box where people put money. So we have different titles if we look on this ark. We have the ark of Yahweh, the ark of the covenant, the ark of God, the ark of the God of Israel, the ark of the God of Israel, of Yahweh, of the host sitting on the cherubim, or the holy ark. So it means already there are so many ways to speak about this ark that maybe it's a long and complicated history. And uh, it becomes even more complicated. I understand some people are interested in textual criticism. It's very often not the same expression in the Septuagint and in the Hebrew Bible. But I don't want to annoy you with that. This could be also part of a whole lecture. But then I think in half an hour, most of you will be sleeping, so we don't do that. What I would like to do is uh, to give you some ideas about this ark, this Aaron, which will be the topic of my <coughs> talk. So if we go from a synchronic perspective, when do we learn the first time about the ark? This is in the book of Exodus, when Moses uh, gets the divine order to build a mobile sanctuary. And one of the first things he has to do is to construct an ark with acacia wood, overlay it with pure bolt. This is a very, very precise description of the ark. You have it here on the screen. I don't read everything. And this description is, in fact, responsible for all the representations we have of the ark, because this is really the only text in which the ark is described, the cherubims, something like that you have here. And <clears throat> this has really inspired most of the artists and also the scientific representations of the Ark. <clears throat> if we go uh, in a more diachronic perspective, uh, most uh, exegetes would uh, agree that these texts come from the priestly uh, milieu, from the priestly writers, uh, P or post P, it's not so important here. But what is interesting here is that the priestly writers, they speak about Aaron HaEdut, the Ark of the Testimony, and not uh, Aaron HaBerit, the Ark of the Covenant. Also, P is using Berit for covenant in several, uh, in several contexts when he speaks about the covenant with Noah and the humanity in uh, Genesis 9 and also in Genesis 17, the covenant with Abraham. So why here? Aaron Haidut. Uh, possibility is if we do a parallel with uh, Mesopotamia, this was also a discussion we had uh, this afternoon, how important are parallels. Here we can do a parallel with Mesopotamian uh, <coughs> construction accounts of temples, and there is always this idea that in a temple you need a deposit tablet which gives either the plan of the temple or relates how uh, the king gets a divine order to construct uh, the temple or the sanctuary. And in this case, as suggested by Hurovitz, maybe uh, the priestly idea of the Ark is uh, inspired by this building inscription. So the Ark would contain uh, not the table of the law, to which I will come in a moment, but a kind of the deposit of a uh, Sanctuary, And this is a portable sanctuary, so the building deposit can be also transported in the ark. If we go to Deuteronomy, it's different because here it's clearly the ark as the container of the tablets of the law. This is clearly said in Deuteronomy 10. You have the text here. The <coughs> ark is also made of wood, but then what should be inside the ark is the tablets of the law. 
The last mention, if we take most by biblical manuscript, you know the order of the Ketuvim is different according to uh, the manuscript we have. In most, we end with chronicles. And so the last word, and this is a very strange word, is uh, from King Josiah, who says to the Levites, put the holy ark in the house that Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, built. Do not carry it on your shoulders anymore. That's very strange. How do you explain that? Because in 1 Kings 8, we learn that Solomon put the ark in the temple. And why now Josiah is saying all of a sudden, now put the ark in the temple? What happened? I leave the question open for the moment. You can think about I give you an idea, not a solution, but an idea later, and then we can discuss what you think. Because <clears throat> it's a little bit different when we see 1 Kings 8. And 1 Kings 8, it's also very strange. Because when uh, Solomon put the ark in the temple, it is said there was nothing in the ark except the two stones. So there is this emphasis on there was nothing else. En ba'aron rak, nothing else. Why somebody said there was nothing else in the ark? It's like we have this prohibition of divine images. You shall not do divine images. But if you have a prohibition, maybe there was something going on. And if somebody is saying there is nothing else than these two tablets, we may suspect original there was maybe something else. And this brings me to an idea of uh, Sigmund Wowinkel. Sigmund Wowinkel, important Scandinavian scholar. He wrote, at the time, French was still like a lingua franca, which has now faded away a little bit. He wrote an article in a French journal, when did the cult of Yahweh in Jerusalem become officially a cult without images? And he said exactly what I just told you, that there was representation of Yahweh before this uh, prohibition of images arose. And in his idea, the original content of the Ark would have been a representation of Yahweh in form of a bull. It's a little bit like what you have here. Because if you look to the stories of the golden calf in Exodus 32 and 1 Kings 12, it's quite clear that there was some tendency to represent Yahweh in the form of a bull, or a young bull or a calf. So uh, <clears throat> he's also related, Movinkel to, he's relating to Psalm 132. Uh, it's a psalm, I will come back to this psalm, about the procession of the ark, maybe to Jerusalem. And in this uh, psalm, Yahweh is called Abir Yaakov, which Movinkel translates the bull of Jacob or the bull of Israel. So Movinkel, this also relates to what we discussed. Movinkel also changed his idea, so a researcher can change the idea. So his first idea was that the bull statue remained in the ark until the destruction of the temple in 587. But then he had a new idea and said maybe when Pharaoh Shechon, Shechon came, Shisha came and uh, conquered Jerusalem, which is historically not so sure, then uh, the ark was deported and a new ark was made and uh, in this new ark, uh, we had two stone statues, Matzebot, which were then identified with the tables of the law. So according to <coughs> Mowinkel and other, maybe there was not just one ark, there were several arks, which does not really correspond to what the Bible is saying, but it's quite clear that uh, the ark in the Bible is related especially to Shiloh. We will see this in a while. So, I think there's no doubt, <clears throat> if we evaluate uh, Movinkel's idea, that the Ark is a transportable sanctuary. I think here we can agree. And we have a lot of uh, parallels, especially in Egypt. Uh, you have here two uh, possibilities, Amun Reis Park and also another bark in the tomb of Mary Mary. Uh, we have <clears throat> Also, something uh, similar in a Phoenician context, 
according to the Phoenician historical philo of Biblos, there was an ark with two gods named Field and Rustic that were associated with a chest pulled by two beasts. That's very close to the story in the book of Samuel. It's a question how much this uh, uh, Phoenician history of Philo of Biblos is influenced by the biblical story, but let this be aside. And then uh, we have also in Palmyra, in the temple of Baal, a procession with a camel, which is also carrying a portable sanctuary. So I think we can agree at least that the Ark originally was a portable sanctuary. So the question is where, whether there were always uh, the tables of the law or something else in this Ark. And if you look <coughs> to uh, representation, Assyrian representations, you have, especially on the right, Tiglath, Pileser's deportation of the gods of Gaza. And if you look on this picture, you see some uh, very anthropomorphic status, quite big ones. And then you have, uh, in here, you have kind of an arc. You have a little coffin or box or whatever, and a smaller deity is there. So you can say maybe the Philistines also had arcs in a way. So this can be related to this maybe also, and uh, maybe also, but this is a reconstruction by my colleague Christoph Uhlinger. He thinks in a deportation by Sargon II, we have maybe a similar phenomenon. And then we may also <coughs> go to the Ark story. I will come back to this in more detailed way in a moment. In 1 Samuel 9, 6.19, the Ark is coming back to Beit Shemesh. I will go back uh, in a while to the Ark story. And what happens there? Yahweh becomes very angry and killed among the people 70 men and then somebody made it 5,000 because 70 were not enough, but that's not the most important thing. The important thing is why Yahweh gets angry. And he gets angry because according, this is <coughs> also different because uh, there's a big difference between the Masoretic text again and the Septuagint. According to the Masoretic text, it's he stroke among the men of Beit Shemesh because they had looked at or in the Aaron Adonai. They had looked inside. So why did he stroke them? Because they had looked inside the ark. So maybe there's something that normal people cannot see, only priests maybe. So this would be another argument that there was some representation of Yahweh originally in the ark. So this is my hypothesis that the ark contained originally a way, this can be stones, this can be uh, figures, this can be like uh, Movinkel was suggesting, suggesting a bull, uh, different possibilities, but uh, I think we can confirm Movinkel's idea that the original ark contained a representation of Yahweh. That the Ark was used in a military context is quite clear in the Ark narrative. But we have also a text in the Book of Numbers. So the Book of Numbers is uh, often considered, rightly in my view, as a late book uh, compared to other books of the Torah. But a late book does not mean that there can be no older traditions. And there is this very uh, strange song about the Ark, which is maybe inserted in another context where the walk out of the, uh, from the Sinai back to the wilderness was preceded by the cloud of Yahweh being over them day when they set out and night to illuminate, as we have in Exodus. And inside this, there is uh, this verse which I have marked in blue. Uh, whenever the ark set out, Moses would say, Arise, Yahweh, let your enemies be scattered, and your foes flee before you. And whenever it came to rest, he would say, Return, Yahweh, of the ten thousands of thousands of Israel. Again, how shall we imagine that Yahweh rising up of the ark coming back? There must be some idea of representation of Yahweh. And uh, here again, uh, you see the military function of the Ark. And that this verse is something special 
It's also seen in uh, the Masoretic edition. If you take uh, the Codex Leningrad or Codex of St. Peter's book, you see that this verse is <coughs> framed by two noon, inverse noon, so which is a way of the Masoretic to say here's something special, which maybe does not fit the context or that that requires special attention. So uh, how to explain that? Uh, in a way, I think the Masoret uh, uh, saw that uh, there's something special going on with these verses 35 and 36. So let's come to the history of the Ark in the book of Samuel. I think you know the story. I, we come back to some details. Uh, in this story, which we have in 1 Samuel 4, uh, 4 to 7, 1, and then 2 Samuel 6, we have uh, the story how the ark was captured by the Philistines from Shiloh, brought to Ashdod, where it defeated Dagan. I will come back to this, and then to other Philistine cities, and there was a lot of plagues, and the Philistines were unhappy, brought it back in a special way, first to Beit Shemesh, then to Kiyat Yerim, and at the end of the story, David came and fetched it to bring it to uh, Jerusalem. So, <clears throat> but before it came to Jerusalem, it stopped in Kiryat Yerim, because Beit Shemesh, you remember, we have seen it, uh, it did not work, and the people of Beit Shemesh consecrated Eleazar to have the charge of the Ark of Yahweh. So the Ark of Yahweh remained in Kiryat Yerim for quite a while until David fetched it to uh, bring it to Jerusalem. And this brought <coughs> Leonard Rost to the idea that there was an independent Ark narrative. Uh, uh, we spoke this morning also about how should we still read the classics? And I say, yes, we should read the classics. It's quite an old book from 1926, almost uh, 100 years, but it's uh, still an important book. Uh, it's more about the succession narrative of David, but he had this idea that the, uh, the arc narrative in which Samuel does not appear was an independent story uh, which was transmitted independently before it was integrated in the book of, of Samuel. He was very, uh, very optimistic. He said this was written by an eyewitness who uh, was living under Solomon and who explained why Solomon could then put the ark in the temple of uh, Jerusalem. So the theory was accepted by many scholars at the time. Also, Martin Ott used it for his deuteronomistic history, but very soon people uh, <clears throat> saw that there were some problems with the story, some problems. First of all, did the story really end with 2 Samuel 6? That means with the transfer of the ark to Jerusalem. Because if you read 1 Samuel 4 to 7, 1, and then 2 Samuel 6, there's no introduction of David. So it's, it's, he came quite abruptly. And if it was an independent story, why 2 Samuel 6 was separated from the foregoing chapter? So there's a lot of question. And uh, also we can see there's a vocabulary and style which is quite different in the chapters 4 to 6 and 2 Samuel 6. So maybe the original arc narrative did not end in Jerusalem, but ended maybe in Kiryat Yerim. And this was, of course, uh, <coughs> something which is very different. I, I just show you these verses. Maybe this was the original ending. And then we would have a very different arc narrative. So <coughs> let us come back a little bit to some details of this arc story. So it all starts with the war between the Philistines and the Israelites. Again, if you take Masoretic text and Septuagint, they don't agree who is at the beginning of this war. According to the Masorets, these are the Philistines. According to the Septuagint, the Israelites waged war. And maybe this was the original story, that the Israelites waged war and for this reason, Yahweh was unhappy and was behind the loss 
of the Ark. For the Masoretes, it's a photo of the Philistines. For the Septuagint, maybe originally it was the idea that the Israel started by themselves to fight against the uh, Philistines. In any case, uh, <coughs> the idea is that after the first defeat, they try to bring the Ark from Shiloh so that Yahweh can come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So here again, you see clearly the function of the Ark. It's a military object, and uh, the idea is that the <coughs> Israelites can be saved. So Shiloh is a very interesting place. As you know, it's in the territories now, and. Uh, Archaeology in the territories is uh, maybe ethically a little bit complicated. There are now some American fundamentalists. I don't know if they still continue to look after the Ark because they still think there is the Ark somewhere. Also, the Bible does not tell us <laughs> this story. But they are looking for remains at least of the sanctuary. I think so far they didn't find so much. But some, some things, uh, anyhow. So uh, <clears throat> it's very interesting because Shiloh, uh, as soon, yeah, as, as much as we can say, if we follow Finkelstein and others, it was destroyed in the middle of the 11th century BCE, and then kind of repopulated, but very sparsely in the 8th and 7th century. And what is very interesting, that in the book of Samuel, Shiloh is not really criticized. What is criticized later is the priestly dynasty of the Elites, but not the sanctuary. And it's even put into a kind of a parallel with Jerusalem. You know, in the Bible now, we have this idea of centralization, especially in the Deuteronomistic history, in the book of Deuteronomy to two kings. The idea is there's only one legitimate sanctuary, which is the Temple of Jerusalem. And this is why all the northern kings are very, very badly noted, because they have other sanctuaries. But Shiloh, in a way, escapes from that. So in Jeremiah 7, uh, when Jeremiah the prophet announces the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem, he puts it into parallel with Shiloh. He said, go now to my place, Makum, that was in Shiloh, and see what I did for it, to it for the wickedness of my people of Israel. And therefore I will do to the house that is called by my name, Jerusalem, in which you trust, uh, <clears throat> just what I did to Shiloh. So this is very interesting. And so if somebody is still looking for a PhD topic, here is a good topic. <laughs> How you explain this? It's very complicated because if Shiloh was destroyed in the 11th century, there was either a very long memory until the 6th century that allowed to parallel the destruction of Shiloh and the destruction of Jerusalem. How do you explain? I have no clear answer about that. Or some people would say there was an Assyrian destruction of Shiloh, but there's no archaeological evidence so far for that. So how do we make this? So for the Deuteronomist, apparently the idea was that there was a kind of succession of sanctuaries that uh, in the first time you have accepted to stay in Shiloh, and then Shiloh was destroyed, and then he moved to Jerusalem. So there's no critique, contrary to Samaria or to Basel and to other places, uh, in the Deuteronomistic history of uh, Shiloh. So if you look to the deportation of the Ark, which we have in the, in the Ark narrative, uh, it again brings us back to the discussion we had this afternoon. It's very comparable to what we have in the Mesopotamian practices where <clears throat> the capture of deities or the status of the deities was meant to demonstrate the superiority of the deities of the victors. The Assyrian do, do this very often, but the uh, older parallels also and later parallels. So in the annals of Sennacherib, we have uh, Sitka, the king of Ashkelon, who had not submitted to my job, the god of his father's house, himself, his wife, and so on. I brought them to Assyria. And I've shown you already uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, relief uh, in an inscription of Sargon, the gods in which they had put their trust 
uh, they are all uh, deported. And that is what the Assyrians do in a way. They uh, deport the state, the, the Ark, which represents in a way a Yahweh, and bring it to the temple of Dagon. And again, what happens to this Dagon? He falls down, he's put up again by uh, the people of Ashdod, and then he's totally smashed. So uh, first night he prostrates himself before Davis because he's falling down like this, and the second time he's totally amputated in a way the Assyrians smashed their statues. So <clears throat> that is very interesting because here we can see apparently that uh, the narrator of this story was very much inspired by this Mesopotamian practices, and he used it in order to show the superiority of Yahweh, Yahweh in the ark, against the deities of the Philistines. So <clears throat> the Philistine cities we have is Ashton, Gad, and Ekron. And Ashton is probably the most powerful of the Philistine cities uh, from the 10th century uh, until the Assyrian period, until the 7th, 6th century and <clears throat> which uh, uh, explains why the Ark comes to Ashdod, of course. And the Temple of Dagon is still mentioned in the time of the Maccabees. Is it still there or is this a memory? But still, uh, there is a relation between Dagon and Ashdod. Uh, Gad is uh, Tel Safi, also an important city. And Ekron, again, a city that remains until the 8th century. So we are somewhere in the 8th, 7th century. And if you look uh, to <coughs> an inscription of Senakenarib about Ezekiah, uh, Seneca Narib was saying, his towns, which I had plundered, I took it away from his country and gave them to Mitini, the king of Ashdod, Padi, the king of Ekron, and Silibil, the king of Gaza. So I reduced his country, but I still increased the tribute. So we have two uh, cities that appears also in the Ark narrative, Ashdod and Gad, and Gaza yeah, was replaced, uh, uh, Ashdod and Ekron, and Gaza was uh, replacing, uh, was replaced by Gad because it's too much on uh, the south. So maybe in its present form, the Ark narrative is somewhere related to these events and claims that, uh, <coughs> in a way, the Ark given back by the Philistines uh, means that there's kind of, yeah, of uh, hope that uh, the Israelite territory could be restored in a way. I don't speak so much now about Beit Shemesh. Uh, Beit Shemesh uh, is also uh, like a frontier. There are some texts in the Bible that suggested that the Philistines had conquered Beit Shemesh. And what is interesting in the Ark narrative, uh, it's uh, that the lords of the Philistines who accompany the Ark, they don't enter Beit Shemesh. They stop outside. So that means that they accept in a way that Beit Shemesh is Israelite now. So the Ark comes to Kiyat Yerim. You remember these things. So the men of Beit Shemesh are stroken, and they say, come and get the Ark. And the people of Kiyat Yerim came and took up the Ark and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. So, uh, Eleaza is also interesting because uh, it sounds a little bit like uh, one of Aaron's son. Uh, he's also Eleaza. And Abinadav may be a combination of the two other sons of, uh, of uh, Aaron, which are Nadab and Avihu. So, maybe there's some relation. But now, let us go to Kiryat Yerim. Kiryat Yerim is not mentioned very often in the Bible. And uh, this uh, ending is more or less en passant. So the Ark comes to Kiyar-Dirim, and apparently there was a priest that was consecrated because the root Kadash is clearly used in Leviticus as for consecration of priests. So what happened in this place? And it's a very nice place. <laughs> it's a very nice place. Uh, you, you see it here, how it looks today. It can be very easily identified with uh, Der El Azar. Today, the Arabic name is Der El Azar. And El Azar, it sounds like Eleazar. And it's close to, to Abu Ghosh. 
Abu Ghosh, uh, which is an Arab city uh, really next to the hill. And uh, the older name of Abu Ghosh was Kiryat el Inab, uh, the hill of the, uh, the, uh, the raisin. <coughs> So Kiryat is also, in a way, uh, Kiryat is also uh, <coughs> still maintained in the Arabic language. So we have Ter El Azar and Kiryat Al Inab. So <coughs> today there is a wonderful church, uh, which is uh, uh, the church of uh, the Lady of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, Notre Dame de l'Arche de l'Alliance. It uh, was founded by a French nun. Uh, Sir Josephine. There's a long story which I cannot tell you, but it's a wonderful story. <laughs> Where Father Lagrange from the Ecole Biblique said to this uh, lady, you have to buy this place in order to build the church. And if you look on the church, it's very interesting because in the modern church, which will have uh, his 100th birthday next year, they're still fundraising, so if you have some money, you can give some money to these <laughs> sisters <laughs> because the church needs restoration. They started now the restoration. Uh, but inside the church, it's very interesting because you have still mosaics from an older sanctuary. Church or monastery is not very clear. Uh, from the Byzantine period, from the 6th, 5th, 6th uh, century, it was destroyed, rebuilt. So there is a long tradition about the Ark in Kiryatirim, and so maybe even uh, if you look how the first uh, Christian sanctuaries were chosen and constructed, we see that it was often on the place of older sanctuaries. So there can be already speculation. Maybe there was some older sanctuary which uh, was then used in order to build this uh, Byzantine church or monastery. If you uh, look uh, on this picture, the top of the hill is broad and, and flat. And uh, this is a result of terrace walls that were erected around it. So had an elevated rectangular platform existed in the site in antiquity, it would be a very, very architectural feature, unique in the Southern Highlands. So something already, if you look on the hill, something is going on. So there was this support wall to, yeah, to, to create a platform. And uh, there were some uh, salvage excavation because next to, to uh, where the sisters have the monastery and the church, there's now a school. And uh, they did some salvage uh, excavation and uh, uh, this salvage excavation showed the importance of Iron Age pottery and activity in the Hellenistic and Roman periods. And uh, there was never really a dig and uh, uh, my big chance was to meet Israel Finkelstein a long time ago, but then we said maybe we can go and dig there. And this was also complicated in the beginning because I had to go to the French consul and to explain him that we don't claim any part of this hill for the state of Israel or for any fundamentalistic people that would like to take it back from the nuns and uh, do whatever. So <coughs> we had uh, this dig. I don't go into details. We had three areas uh, because we could not, we could not dig in the garden in, on the top of the hill. Now we could, because we went back to the sisters, so they give us allowance, but then came COVID. So, but uh, yeah, well, let's see, maybe we'll do a uh, last season. Uh, so anyhow, what came out of, <coughs> of this uh, excavation was in fact the uh, existence of massive support walls that created the summit platform. That was quite clear. What was less clear was how to date it, because there was a lot of pottery from the Iron Age, but it was mixed with pottery from later period, Hellenistic and Roman period, uh, because the wall was reused, the parts of the stones was taken away, so the dating is complicated, and uh, you cannot have, uh, what is the English word for carbon 14? Carbon 14, oh, I, I think so. We cannot do it because we need, <laughs> we need uh, of course, uh, living material. And so we tried uh, 
optical stimulated luminescent stating, which is also very complicated, but which shows how much uh, the stones were exposed to the sun. Uh, so we had a lady specialist on, on this. And so the idea was that the first construction, the most probable date, probable, again, archaeology is not uh, an exact, exact science neither, because sometimes archaeologists claim archaeology has shown. Uh, archaeologists can give indications, but not proof. So also we should be careful about Archaeology, it's like biblical science, we go with hypothesis, but a good hypothesis would be the 8th century. And um, it's clear that this pottery, uh, the iron 2B pottery, is the most present. And then if it's in the 8th century that this wall was built, then we have a trouble with the biblical story. Because according to the biblical story, this happened much earlier. So, who would be <coughs> a good candidate? First of all, uh, we can see, we can think about the Assyrians, but the Assyrians came a little late into the south. So, and uh, interestingly, we have uh, uh, this kind of elevated platform, not in the south, but very clearly in Samaria. If you go to Samaria, uh, where they had very important digs in the 30s by Americans, uh, you, you can still see this platform, which is very close to what we have in, uh, in Kia Ethereum. So the idea, and this is uh, again related to our discussion, if we compare what the archaeologists could say, what the biblical scholars could say, in this case we could say that maybe the best candidate for constructing this platform could be a king of the north, and which king we can have in mind. This is again a hypothesis, I, I say it again, it's not, uh, it's not uh, truth, it's a hypothesis. This could be Jeroboam II. Jeroboam II, who, lived, uh, who ruled almost 40 years. Again, in the Bible, not much is said for him, but if you read attentively uh, the verses we have about him in uh, Kings 14, uh, he's quite respected by the Deuteronomists. Also, he's from the north, but they don't dare to, to criticize him too much. They criticize a little bit, but still. So uh, Yahweh is with him in a way, and so maybe <clears throat> it's under his rule that uh, Israel gained maximal territorial expansion, uh, control over uh, Benjamin, and so maybe that it was Jeroboam, who brought the ark from Shiloh to Kiryatirim, if, if the ark was brought from there. Or In any case, I think it's a plausible hypothesis to explain the importance of Kiryatirim in the ark narrative. And also, uh, <clears throat> this would prove that the oldest version of 1 Samuel 4 to 6 or 7 1 uh, was this foundation story of the sanctuary of Kiryatirim. Of course, then we can discuss, is the Philistine thing already part of the story or not? It's very complicated. But <clears throat> I think there is some uh, plausibility in order to say there was an arc narrative that explained the holy, the holy side of Kiryat Yerim. Then, of course, the question arises, when came the ark to Jerusalem? Was it David? This is, of course, what the biblical writers are claiming. If we follow this reconstruction, it cannot be David. So, who can it be? <laughs> Maybe it was much later, because if you read attentively the Book of Kings, once Solomon puts the ark in the temple, it remains there, but nothing is told anymore about the ark. A lot of things are told before the ark is coming to Jerusalem, but then nothing is told anymore. The Germans would say there is a Ladeschweigen, a silence about the ark. And maybe this can be explained by the, because there were so many wars, they could have taken the ark for, for different wars, but they don't do. So one hypothesis would be that the ark came to the temple maybe quite late. Under Josiah, for instance, who could gain control 
over Benjamite territories. And maybe, according to the Book of Kings, he destroyed a lot of sanctuaries, Bethel especially, <coughs> but he did maybe not dare to destroy the Ark. So maybe he could have fetched the Ark and bring it to the <coughs> Temple of Jerusalem. Uh, that Kiryatirim was still important at this time, uh, is also uh, in a way confirmed by uh, what we found in Area C, which is the most downhill. In Area C, there is a still a uh, functioning little city, maybe even with a kind of a sanctuary. Uh, it's not so clear, but uh, it means, sorry, that it was still something going on there in the 7th, 6th century. And uh, this also confirms a saying which is in the book of Jeremiah, where they have uh, this strange idea that there was another man prophesying in the name of Yahweh, Uriah, from, uh, son of Shemaiah, from Kiadarim. And he comes from Kiadarim to Jerusalem. So maybe he came with the ark to Jerusalem. This is speculation, of course. But it means that Kiadarim is mentioned in this context of the seventh century, let's say. And uh, this brings me back to <clears throat> the strange order of Josiah to the Levites in 2 Chronicles 35. This, uh, this verse is missing in the Book of Kings. Uh, it's only in Chronicles. So uh, put the holy ark in the house that Solomon, king, uh, <coughs> son of David, king of Israel, built. So what would uh, explain this order? Some people uh, following Jewish tradition would say that Josiah would have hidden the ark uh, <clears throat> because uh, of all kinds of uh, dangers. Or uh, other people would say the ark had been removed by Manasseh, but the Bible don't, does not tell about this. So maybe the best explanation is that this verse still preserves a memory of the ark being brought into the temple of Jerusalem under Josiah. This would be an explanation why there is so silence about uh, the ark. And then, of course, the other mystery, or the, let's see, yeah, uh, uh, related to this, we can also maybe just mention this Psalm 132, which may be also alluding to the procession of the ark from Ya'ak, Ya'atirim, probably, to uh, Jerusalem. But then the other question is, and I go quickly, is about the disappearance of the ark. Uh, we don't know what happened to the ark. That's why you have all the films and movies and, and other speculations, because when the temple was destroyed, the ark is not mentioned. It just mentioned the vessels of the temple that were deported here and there, and uh, <clears throat> the ark is neither mentioned among the objects of the temple that the Persians gave back to the Judeans in Ezra 1 or 5. So what happened to the ark? Was it destroyed? Was it hidden? Uh, was it taken as a booty to Babylon? everything is possible, and there is indeed uh, in the Bible a clear indication that there was some discussion about the rebuilding of the ark. Because you have this very strange text in Jeremiah 3, where it is said, uh, <clears throat> you shall not say anymore the ark of the covenant of Yahweh. It shall not come to mind or be remembered or missed. It will not be made again. It will not be made again. So there were people saying the ark should be made again. And what uh, the author of this verse is saying is Jerusalem shall be called the throne of Yahweh. Because according to 1 Kings 8, the ark is kind of a throne in a way, or this, uh, this expression Yahweh uh, sitting on the ark uh, of the cherubim. So that means the voice in Jeremiah is saying no more ark. And this is contrary to what we had in the text I already presented to you, that Exodus 25, the priestly authors, I think they wanted to rebuild the ark. And I think you have to see this text in the context of reconstruction of the ark, maybe with another function of the cherubim, of the cuperate, of the throne of mercy and all this. This should be rebuilt. This was the idea probably of the priestly writers, were they successful or not? What do you think? Was there, was there an ark in the second temple or not? <laughs> you can go to the ark of Titus, which is not so 
<laughs> which is not so far from here. And there's a whole discussion because uh, the Ark of Titus, as you know, it's a depiction of the plundering of the second temple. And uh, some people take it, uh, Movinkel especially, takes it as an indication that there was an ark because you can see there's a menorah, but there's also like an object like something cubic. So uh, some people would say uh, this is a box or a chest, this is the ark. Uh, others would say it's more likely to be the table of showbread which contained cakes or breads as offerings. So. I think there's no much indication that there was really an ark in the second temple. But uh, the discussion was ongoing, what happened to the ark, and uh, uh, in the book of Maccabees, we have this idea that Jeremiah took the ark with other parts of the temple and hid it under the mount of Nebo. And the idea is that the place shall remain unknown until God gathers his people together again. So this is a kind of a rabbinic thinking of Jeremiah 3. Why the ark should not be rebuilt? Because the original ark was not destroyed. It was hidden by Jeremiah. So why rebuild a new ark? You have to wait until the end of the time and the ark will come back. And this is also what happens then in the book of Revelation. Uh, God's temple in heaven was opened at the end of the time, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen within his trembling. Also in Arabic traditions, Islamic traditions, uh, the Ark is mentioned in the Quran, and uh, in the uh, commentaries in the Hadith, the idea is the Mahdi, the, the Messiah, the Islamic Messiah, will bring the Ark out of his hiding place. There are different hiding places according to, uh, to Islamic traditions, can be in the Sea of Galilee, sometimes someplace in Antioquia, but it's not so important, but it's interesting how this uh, continues, and maybe I will stop with the last wonderful example of the story of the Ark. It's the Ark in Ethiopia. So <laughs> you know the story of the Ark, uh, <coughs> in the Kebranagast, in the book of the glories of the king, which comes from the 14th century, based maybe on older traditions. And this, I think, is a very interesting story because I think the authors of the story, the authors, or what is behind this story, it's a strange observation that after Solomon puts the ark in the temple, it's not mentioned anymore. So there's a whole story about the queen of Sheba coming to visit Salomon, and she did not just visit Salomon, they had some more close contact, and out of this close contact came a son, uh, Menelik, who was born in Ethiopia, and who came to visit his father, and his father was so much impressed by this son that he wanted to make uh, his successor in Jerusalem, but Menelik said, no, I have gone back to, to my country, and so Solomon said, okay, I will give you a young man that will accompany you. And one of these young men, <coughs> who was, uh, <coughs> I think, uh, I have to, think, I don't have it written here. So anyhow, so Azariah, yeah, Azariah, the son of Tzadok, he said, if we go back to, uh, to Ethiopia, we need to take the ark with us. So he made a copy of the ark, which he put in the temple, and the real ark then came to Ethiopia, where according, you know this better than me, where according to this tradition, it's still today and is kept in a special sanctuary, so the ark is still there, but nobody can see it, but we have to believe it. So you see that the ark is still going on, also for legitimation of this Ethiopian uh, Christianity who claims to be the real successor of uh, Solomon. But there are so many other stories. There's also the Cathedral of Chartres where some people say the Ark was buried by the Crusaders. And okay, you see how important this Ark is and you see also how biblical tradition uh, triggered then reception in very different ways. So thank you very much for your attention. I was a little long, sorry. No, no, that's fine. We, we, we didn't feel uh, time flying, so. <clears throat> now, I think uh, you have the floor. <clears throat> sorry. Uh, there is a mic there. Uh, just raise your hand, and then uh, it will be given to you uh, so that you ask your question. 
Thank you very much for your input. <coughs> Sorry, as I said, you can ask your question either in Italian or in English, and Professor Römer said French, German. <laughs> Thank you so much for your lecture, Professor. If we consider the historicity of the arc and of uh, the united monarchy, for which reason the arc would have not been brought to Jerusalem mm. by David or by Solomon? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a question how we read the biblical text. So if, uh, if we read the biblical text as giving direct historical information, we can ask the question. If we look, uh, also if you use archaeology and we look, for instance, on this side of Kiarit Yerim, where we see before the, uh, let's go the highest we can, 9th, 8th century, there's nothing in this, uh, the very sparse uh, uh, Bronze Age remains. So the wall cannot be older than uh, this 9th or 8th century. <laughs> Uh, we have to think, how do we combine this observation with the biblical narrative? And we have also to ask, what is the claim of the biblical writers? Of course, what the biblical writers want to suggest, that the ark was in Jerusalem from the time of David. For what reason? This is then the question we have to ask. Is it just the historical information, or is this a claim to say this ark was there from the very beginning, or not came very late. So I think this is a, a question we have to ask for all biblical texts that claim to be historical texts. And even if they are historical texts, they always want to show something. Uh, I, I said it very quickly this morning, for instance, about this Jeroboam who uh, built the golden calves uh, for Dan and for Bethel. And in the Bible, it's Jeroboam the first. And if the archaeologists now tell us that the region of Dan came under Israel control only in the 8th century, if we trust them again, uh, then we have also a problem. Uh, how to explain? And then maybe an explanation would say maybe it's not Jeroboam the first, maybe it's Jeroboam the second. Uh, because, uh, again, for the Deuteronomistic uh, redactors, they wanted to show that the Northern Kingdom from the very beginning had competing sanctuaries with Jerusalem, Dan and Basel. But yeah, here it's a way how we read the biblical text and how much we use also archaeology to be informed about our understanding, our historical understanding of the text. So uh, I think it's even sometimes more complicated. If we have the patriarchal stories, uh, we know, we know. Most of us would agree that these are legends and it's very complicated to date them. If you have uh, stories from the book of Samuel and Kings, we are more close to history in a way, uh, but this makes things sometimes even more complicated. And uh, especially for the origins of the question of the united monarchy, of the, ro um, of the role that is given to David. So uh, I think we have here to be very careful and also use as much information as we can get. Of course, you can do internal critique of the text, so like an archaeologist, you can put away what is Deuteronomistic, then you have an older strata, but even the older strata, it's not always easy to date the older strata, so uh, then we need uh, to take everything we can uh, to, to construct a, probably a possible historical background. And that's why I, I chose this uh, uh, <clears throat> this example with Kia Diarim because I find it's very speaking. On the other hand, uh, it's very interesting uh, that uh, more down on the hill, there is uh, apparently activity in the 7th, 6th century. And here, all of a sudden, this uh, is very coherent with what we have in Jeremiah 26. So archaeology sometimes can concord or sometimes can push us to have other uh, hypotheses of dating some uh, biblical texts. Yeah. 
Grazie. Grazie. E la mia domanda riguarda l'aspetto narrativo. Oltre la storicità di questa, di questa dell'arca, qual, qual sarebbe la funzione narrativa della presenza dell'arca nel capitolo 6, secondo libro di Samuele, dopo l'unzione di Davide? Perché questo, questa presenza dell'arca? Okay, so it is about the narrative e function of 2 Samuel 6 or, or the whole book of Samuel? No, no, uh, 2 Samuel, I mean, uh, the presence of the art. Uh, in français, oui, je peux parler ah. français. Oui, je peux parler français. Oui, tu peux parler français. Oui, oui. Et, et du point de vue narratif, mm. pourquoi nous trouvons l'arche au chapitre 6 mm -hmm. du second livre de Samuel Qual è la, quelle è la funzione narrativa mm. tenendo conto del contesto politico? Okay. Perché que David dirà un po' a, a Mika che ho dansé mm -hmm. perché Dio mi ha scelto, non ha mm -hmm. scelto il tuo padre. Mm. Yeah. Ok, okay so, uh, what is the function of 2 Samuel 6 in a narrative context? But it's not necessarily only narrative context, it's also, as you say, it's a political context. And uh, so first of all, there's, there are many things going on in 2 Samuel 6, so I didn't have the time to, to uh, tell the whole story. The ark is still dangerous because somebody wants to touch it, even to hinder that it falls down, and he's broken. Uh, and so the ark is not coming directly to Jerusalem. It needs to go into a kind of a quarantine before David can fetch it. So it's again something about the dangerous character of the ark, And then uh, what you was mentioning, David dancing before the ark and criticizing by his wife, who is, from <laughs> who is the daughter of Saul. This is also, of course, a legitimation of David uh, as the real king uh, compared to Saul. And of course, in a way, more broadly speaking, Uh, and this is a problem, uh, I think, for the biblical writers, that David, the founder of the chosen dynasty, did not build the temple. This is a big question. Why David did not build the temple? Why we have to wait until Solomon? Uh, because the founder of a dynasty normally builds a sanctuary, and David does not do it. So there is a tendency, and it's even more strong if you go to the book of Chronicles, There's a tendency to make David not the, cons the builder, because this cannot be, but he prepares everything. So he brings the ark, and then he gives instruction to Solomon to build. But then it's also this very strange text in, uh, what is this, 2 Samuel 12, I think, after the adultery of Bathsheba. So the first son out of this union, uh, Yahweh makes him die. And after he died, it said that Yahweh, who was, uh, sorry, David, who was uh, praying and, and asking that uh, the child should be uh, living, uh, when he learned that it was dead, he, he washed himself, and then he said, it said in the biblical text, he went to the Beit Adonai. He went to the house of Yahweh. So how we should understand this? <laughs> Maybe there was a temple already that Solomon was renovating or reorganizing. It's very complicated, but uh, there is this, uh, I think there is this tendency uh, in the Bible to bring David as much as possible in relation to, to the temple. Uh, and I think the Ark uh, story in 2 Samuel 6 also is part of this, but it's not the only, it's not the only uh, uh, function of the story. I think it's all the function to show that David is definitely the chosen one and not uh, the family of Saul, I think. Yeah. But you had a question also. <laughs> Now I'm afraid if a question is coming from Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I, I wanted to ask about these uh, two uh, partially different narratives. Mm -hmm. One you have in Samuel 1, 1 1 Samuel 4 to 6 uh, and the ark yeah, uh, finishes yeah. in Kiryat Yerim. And then you have in uh, Kings and Chronicles uh, the connection of the ark with Solomon and Josiah. Mm -hmm. Well, it would be logical that uh, 
what is uh, what Solomon did uh, may have may have been done by Josiah mm. and it's transferred mm. to uh, to Solomon. It's quite possible, but these two uh, partially different narratives, uh, because one is an ark as a military mm -hmm. element and the other is a temple element. Yes. Do you think that there were two different arcs, two different tradition, uh, or how? Because it seems like two different streams yes, of tradition. Yes. I, I agree. That there was, or there is this idea among some scholars that maybe there was not just one arc, that there were several arcs, which is not, which we cannot exclude. The biblical presentation suggests that it's the same arc. Of course, we can disagree and we can say maybe there are different arcs. But uh, I think, in a way, if you look to Chronicles, Chronicles is transforming everything in liturgical or in sacrificial uh, functions. So in Chronicles, I, I see no problem. Uh, the question is what happened to the ark once it's put in the temple by Solomon. You can see it comes part of the temple objects because it's true, later we don't learn anything more about the ark. So you can see either it's a different object or it's already a transformation of the writers from the time of Josiah or whenever this has been written uh, in order to show the ark is now come to his final uh, his final place, because we have this, uh, as I mentioned, this very strange text, but it's not used then so much. There's nothing in the Ark than the two tablets of the law. Uh, why this insistence? And even if you look how the Ark is presented in 1 Kings 8, it's not really about the tablets of the law so much. And uh, later also you have all kind of rabbinic speculation that maybe there was more in the Ark, there was maybe the rod of Aaron, there was part of manna, and so I think it's something still going on, what was in the, the ark. So I think uh, the Deuteronomists in, in 1 Kings 8, they want to settle the thing, but they don't really succeed so much in settling it definitely. I, I would not uh, disagree with the possibility that there were different arcs, but then also it's not so clear uh, how these two, I think it's very clear in, in 1 Samuel 4 to 7 and also in the book of Numbers. In the conquest narrative, it's more complicated because the, I, I did not speak about the book of Joshua because I have here an eminent colleague about Joshua, so I didn't mention the ark there. But you also see the Levites, uh, they, it's also very liturgical in a way. Also, it's linked to the conquest. So maybe it's also kind of a combination already of this older tradition related to, to warfare and then maybe in this reinterpretation as a more liturgical object as we have it in, in the Book of Kings and especially then in, in, uh, in Chronicles, yeah. Other question, Paul said to me this afternoon, a student raised the question, how, no, what was the question? How intelligent was, no, uh, what is a good question? And uh, I think every question is a good question, so don't feel, <laughs> don't, don't feel embarrassed or shy if you have, any question is fine. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for your lecture. Maybe my question is a little bit related to the question of uh, Father Hector. How much do we really need to look for a real physical object behind the ark? Or is it possible to put it in terms of gradual dematerialization of the ark towards a literary topos? Like perhaps an original physical object became a literally, a literal device, literal topos. Okay. Uh, okay, you can say the arc is just a narrative uh, feature, uh, but then I think you have a number of observations that makes this a little difficult. I think, of course, uh, even if you read the arc narrative as we have it now, it's a very theological story. And if you look uh, precisely what's going on, there's a lot of parallels between the Philistines and the Exodus tradition. And uh, uh, in 1 Samuel 4, you have the idea that 
the Philistines recognizes, in fact, the power of Yahweh in a way, and that Yahweh is behind the fact that the ark was taken away from the Israelites. So you can read it in a very, and I think this is also the way the text wants to be read now, in a very theological and not so much historical way. On the other hand, I think we have first, we have uh, comparative material. I showed you some picture from Egypt, which shows, and even maybe this deportation from the Assyrians, uh, there are some of these portable sanctuaries. So I think what makes the Ark narrative plausible, at least, is the fact that Arcs existed. And uh, also the question that I brought up with Jeremiah 3, and maybe this uh, priestly text about the reconstruction of the Ark, if this would have been only uh, like a, a theological um, symbol, object, and there was no historical background for this, uh, this discussion would be a little, bit, uh, a little bit complicated to understand. So I think, of course, the Ark narrative is a theological narrative also. And some people also read the Ark as a symbol about exile and coming back. But this, I think, is not so good because the Ark is lost from Shiloh and then comes back either to Kiryat Yerim or to Jerusalem. So this exilic reading, I, I don't like it too much, but some people would, would argue like this. Uh, recently, Cynthia Edenburg shared a very nice article about the Ark, but I disagree with her also. I respect her very much. Uh, it's not just a symbol for being exiled. Uh, the glory of Yahweh is exiled. This is one of the words in 1 Samuel 4, but it's more complicated, I would say. So uh, I still think uh, we should combine the both observation and say that there was uh, some historical object that is called in the Bible Ark, maybe one, maybe more. In, in the Bible, it's really represented as one object. So we can still, of course, discuss. And then this object triggered a lot of stories and explanation. It was put in the conquest. It was put in many other texts. But uh, I think here we should not uh, oppose uh, this uh, reading as a symbol of Yahweh's presence and a concrete uh, portable shrine. I think both things can, can be uh, combined very, very easily. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your very interesting conference. Uh, do you have an idea of the etymology of Aaron? Because Teva, it's David, is from Egyptian, it's clear. Yeah, but maybe the origin of the word itself can give an origin of the function, original function of this object. Yeah. Is it a Semitic word? It's a West so? Semitic word, as much as I can say. It's a West Semitic word. Uh, I haven't seen any parallels with Egyptian. I think even Gurk, who finds parallels with everything in, in Egypt, he did not come up with an Egyptian. So I, I don't know. It's, uh, apparently you have it in uh, West Semitic languages as a chest, as a cover. And uh, so I don't have more information about that. So, of course, sometimes it's interesting. Some people were arguing the other way around that the name of... Uh, of Moses' brother, Aaron, would have been a kind of combination with Aaron. Aaron would be uh, related to the Ark. But this is maybe a little bit speculative. I, <laughs> I don't know how much. Because some people are arguing that Aaron, the, the brother, is related to Egyptian also. So complicated, yeah. <laughs> you don't really agree. I, I don't have an idea. <laughs> Thank you. If um, there are no questions, shall we thank Professor Römer uh, with a clap and call it a day? <laughs> so thank you very much. I don't know if uh, the rector wants to say something before. No. <laughs> so I would like to thank you again for also for being there, most of you the whole day from this morning until uh, the evening, so it has been a very long time. Thank you for, 
your interest and uh, so I, I wish you all the best for your PhD in progress or starting or wherever you are and I think there will be opportunity to continue the conversation in uh, in what is it April April so uh, okay but Paul I think is managing this and he's collecting your suggestions about what we shall speak then and yeah okay so have a good evening and see you soon.